Okay, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Elvira Meridomino, I hope I pronounced it correctly, from University of uh, Zaragoza. She's going to talk on effective dimension and the point to set principle for separable spaces, the Hilbert cube and the hypercube. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, can I put it in my pocket? Okay. Uh, let's try. Uh, yeah, it's this fine? Does it sound a bit better? Okay. Uh, so let's see. Um, the, the three main things I'm going to be uh, covering today is that there are uh, several. Uh, different uh, effectivizations of uh, fractal dimension with different goals. Uh, then the point to set principle uh, can be seen as a unifying tool among those. So there's some relationship that it gives you. And then the same, the point to set principle, uh, we are all probably uh, aware that it, it is a way of proving um, classical uh, geometric uh, measure theory result using uh, computability. But uh, what I also want to stress today is that uh, it does gives us a lot of insight about this uh, effect, effective uh, notion, about this effective dimension. Okay. So, you know, we all know that um, House of dimension is a way of uh, extending the natural intuition of uh, geometric integer dimensions. And you have probably seen this definition at some point in your life. So the concept of uh, house of dimension is based on the concept of uh, house of measure. Okay. So uh, the house of dimension is like the, the flipping point, the S in which uh, house of measure goes from infinity to zero. There is also a dual definition that is usually called packing dimension. When we effectivize, sometimes we also say a strong dimension. It is also based on a measure. In this case, uh, let's say it's S packing measure. Uh, the definition is pretty dual to the previous one for halves of dimension, but there is kind of an extra quantifier. You need to use the sigma union in this uh, definition of uh, packing measure. And again, the packing dimension is the flipping point, again, from infinity to zero. Yeah, you, you're all aware of all these, but you know that in these uh, definitions, there is no guarantee that you're going to have an S for which this uh, packing measure or house of measure is going to be uh, finite and non-zero. Okay? You can usually really, depending on, on your case, you can really flip from infinite to zero without going to any useful value in the middle. Uh, I will not talk too much about this, but let's say uh, after the wonderful talk by uh, Ted Slayman Monday, he was very interested you know, in, uh, in capturing this, uh, even effectivizing this uh, household measure. Whereas I will have a more modest uh, goal. I, I will not worry about trying to really effectivize you know, this household measure and kind of capture effectively uh, finite non-zero values. I'll be happy enough if I can have a meaningful uh, value for the dimension. So, well, when we effectivize dimension, we basically have two ways of doing so. The first one has to do with gambling. Okay? So we are in counter space. We want to talk about the uh, points. And we use a uh, degeneralization of martingales, which are called S-gales. They represent some betting game. 
uh, uh, on which uh, we, we bet knowing finite prefixes of our point. Okay. Uh, you know that a martingale is a one gale. This is, this is just a generalization. Uh, we are looking for infinite success, sorry, for uh, best case success. So we only need that the, the values of this uh, gale go uh, infinitely often uh, unbounded. So they are unbounded. And of course, uh, having a successful S gale is the same as having a martingale that infinitely often is about the value to, to the n or uh, to the one to the one minus s in this p. You will have that. And then once you have uh, the definition of gale, of S gale, the effectivization comes from considering only effective S scales, let's say lower semi-computable L scales. So the effective dimension of a point X is just the smallest S for which uh, you can succeed. Okay? So an S scale can succeed. And of course, uh, well, I, I kept saying things you probably all know, but this, our effectivizations are mostly uh, point-wise. So you define them for points and then for, for sets, you have like the supreme for all the elements in the set. The second way we effectivize comes from information theory from Kolmogorov complexity. Okay, so uh, we, the definition of uh, Kolmogorov complexity of a point X at precision delta is thus the Kolmogorov complexity of a rational point in the neighborhood or in the delta neighborhood of X, so the, the simplest such point or the Kolmogorov complexity, the smallest Kolmogorov complexity of such point. This is the uh, Kolmogorov complexity at precision. And given that, you can define the effective dimension of a point, again, is taking the information ratio, okay? so the Kolmogorov complexity over the, uh, the size of delta. And again, you can do this for sets, is taking the supremum. And this gives you a definition that is fully equivalent to the one we did with S scale in the previous slide. Okay? So these are the main ways of effectivizing uh, fractal dimensions. There are versions for a uh, strong dimension for packing dimension, in which mostly, well, the quantifiers change. So the best and the worst case are interchains. So for instance, uh, for um, information content, for the strong dimension, you take the worst case, okay? So you take, uh, you want this, uh, Quantity this uh, the delta approximated Kolmogorov complexity to be uh, small everywhere. Okay, so this is kind of the what we probably all know so far. I wanted to make you aware of that there are many ways to effectivize dimension. Okay, uh, but let's start saying why do we effectivize. Uh, when I started working on this uh, quite a few years ago, uh, we were very interested in quantifying complexity class. Okay? So comparing the size of co uh, complexity classes, you know, as a way of generalizing complexity classes separation, you know, P versus MP, et cetera. Well, if you cannot really separate classes, maybe you can try to quantify the difference and, you know, it may be easier in some way. So this was what the, the first reason to effectivize dimension for us. And uh, the, the advantage of measure over, uh, sorry, of dimension over more uh, probabilistic or measure uh, quantifying methods is that for dimension, everything has a dimension. There are no non-measurability issues. So you just have to make this dimension value to be meaningful, okay? So it's useless if it's always infinite or zero. So I just try to make it something that can uh, help you distinguish size. 
The second uh, reason is partial randomness, okay? So you want to have a, a source of randomness that is good enough for a certain algorithm or for a certain family of algorithms. And you know, randomness is expensive. So you want to, to have the minimum you can, you can have. So the, the definitions, the concepts of Martin Love randomness and more uh, uh, generalizations of results bounded uh, concepts based on Martin Love randomness. Yeah, they're very good, but if we, if in a certain context we can do with uh, less randomness, then it will save us resources uh, in, in many sense. And the third reason is of course, well, let's see what we can do uh, in geometric measure theory. Let's see which, in, which sets they were looking at from the beginning, we can analyze using effective dimension. And well, maybe for some cases, this will give us the whole analysis for the classical case. Uh, and if not, let's see what this tells us about the, both the classical and the effective case. So, uh, ways to effectivize uh, dimension then are, well, to, to make it more precise, we, we avoid infinite um, dimension cases, uh, meaning that uh, maybe this original definition of house of, well, the, uh, the gauge of functions that uh, that introduced Monday can give us more exact analysis. Then, of course, sometimes uh, when, when we deal with uh, countable objects, everything becomes uh, dimension zero. So let's try to, to do something more useful with that. And uh, the third thing we can do is we can use Oracle. So let's see about the, the first way to, to effectivize dimension, the first way to, to parameterize these effectivizations. Well, we have, uh, instead of using uh, directly uh, as house of measure, let us change this definition. Let us have uh, five uh, halves of measure in the sense that the way the diameter contributes to the size of to the covering size is parameterized by this phi. Okay, and then you have many choices for phi. And well, let's find the one that is going to be more meaningful in your case. Uh, the definition is pretty. Uh, once you choose a gauge family that is function parameterized by by some s, the definition is very similar to the original uh, house of dimension. Uh, Let's say, I just wanna say that, yes, uh, maybe repeat again that uh, uh, I won't, I'll try not to repeat too much from uh, Ted's uh, talk Monday, but let me stress that he was very interested in a single gauge function. So he kind of wanted to have a uh, an, uh, house of measure that was uh, enough for, for your set. Whereas here I'm going back to uh, trying to, analyze the dimension. Okay, so I'm just looking for the S that is the, the flipping uh, point okay, from uh, usually infinite zero. Okay, so while uh, we can, uh, in order to effectivize this uh, gate uh, dimensions, you can still keep using uh, gales, just uh, generalizing the definition, use the phi in the definition of gale, that's still okay. But I will give you more ideas later. So the second thing I wanted to spend a minute uh, uh, talking about different uh, resource bounds that give you different effectivizations of dimension. I really like finite state dimension. Uh, let me summarize a few things we know about it. So finite state means the, it is, uh, uh, so the effectivization is done at the level of finite state machine. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it does break the usual equivalence between uh, Euclidean and Cantor space, because as you may know, uh, uh, it's not the same 
to do gambling or to do uh, compression or to do polymorph complexity. Uh, when you write uh, the real number in a certain base or you write it in another, things can change drastically. Uh, so it is space dependent. So it's not, uh, it's not a Euclidean space anymore. Uh, randomness is equivalent to dimension one or to uh, full uh, incompressibility. So this is, this is weird. And this is interesting because it does capture the notion of a Borel normality. You may know, by the way, find it out. So it's, uh, it gives you like many tools to deal with this uh, Borel normality. It can be, as I told you, it can be characterized both in terms of gambling and compression. And of course, with uh, finite state machines, you don't have universality. But this is, sometimes you do have a certain mild universality in the, in the sense of uh, quasi-linear uh, algorithms, such as lempel so it's not, it's not the same as universality, but if you're willing to pay the price, it gives you a pretty sort of universal idea. Then you have polynomial time dimension. This is very used in uh, analyzing co uh, complexity classes. When you deal with time bounds, such as polynomial time, unfortunately, you cannot do it using compression. So you need to do it only with gambling. Uh, it is very useful for complexity classes that are within exponential time. Uh, there, is a very, there are very interesting relationships between polynomial time and quasi-polynomial time. Quasi is to the polylog. And this is related to the fact that uh, linear exponential time and polynomial exponential time complexity classes are also very close in, in many interesting ways. Again, you don't have universality. Uh, I will uh, skip this space dimension. This is a bit nicer in the sense of it does have uh, compression characterization, but not as nice because you don't have universality again. And then we have our favorite probably in this crowd, which is uh, effective dimension. Uh, it is very robust, can be uh, defined both in terms of gambling and compression, and it does have universality. So let's see, what I want to show you with this slide is that all these definitions are not just the same. You know, they, they have their, their idiosyncrasies. Yes, okay, they, they have their differences and there's not, they are not easy to, to compare, okay? So you don't, you don't know one, know all of them. But what happens is that, except for finding the state, unfortunately, they can all be relativized. Okay? You can put oracles in most of the effectivity in the gambling or in the uh, cosmograph complexity or both. So uh, I'm gonna show you now next the point to set principle. And the point to set principle um, is always presented as a way of getting back. Well, it's so, so far has been, the, the presentation has been expressing that you get back classical house of dimension. But I also wanted to, to use it as a kind of comparing tool between all these resource files. So let me show you. So uh, Neil and Jack Lutz in 2018, they proved that um, uh, the house of dimension of a set of perhaps sort of Euclidean space is, uh, a, is a effective dimension for some Oracle B. And actually there is a precise oracle B for which you get back a uh, uh, classical dimension when you do the effective say. Also for uh, packing dimension, the same result, well, I mean, a similar result all, yeah? So in a minute, I'll show you a couple of example, well, one example actually, one, that's all I have time for, about uh, how to, to use this result mostly to get uh, new results in uh, classical uh, geometrical uh, measure theory. But uh, you can all start thinking, you know, uh, 
uh, what is this B there? I mean, how, how hard is going to be this B? What relationship does it have with A? You know, we want, I mean, we want to look at backwards. Maybe we are more interested in how, uh, which is this B and what can we know about it, about it because it gives you back a classical house dimension. I will not give you good answers to this, but I think this is the kind of idea that I like more people to work, okay? Try to uh, reverse engineer this, this theorem. Okay, and also this uh, point to set principle uh, can be done at other results around uh, effectivizations. Okay, so for instance, uh, you can take uh, polynomial time and quasi polynomial time effective dimension, and you can get one from the other by using the appropriate oracle. Okay, so this is like first result. I won't give you many details, but it's kind of intuitive what, what it means. But also you can do it for other resource bounds. They don't have to be that close. So this uh, the second result, more general, and for instance means that you can use you can have a classical house of dimension in terms of polynomial time dimension. I would dare to say even lower time bounds, like uh, quasi linear linear time bounds would also. Uh, house of dimension. So in this way, this is what I mean when saying that different effectivizations, they kind of get, uh, uh, how you say, get uh, related by this point to set principle. Okay. So this was one thing I wanted to say. And the other thing I, I wanted really to show you for a minute, um, how useful this uh, point to set principle is in a uh, classical setting, yes, quick, but I really like this Marston, Marston theorem. Marston theorem is proven for analytic sets, and it tells you that the dimension of most of the projections, most in the sense of almost every angle in a, an orthogonal projection, the dimension is the minimum between the dimension of the set and one. Okay, this is for R2. And uh, uh, in 2018, uh, Lutz and Stoll, they uh, improved this theorem because they proved it instead of analytic for sets for which uh, Hausdorff and packing dimension coincide. This in fractal uh, jargon, they're usually called regular sets, regular in the sense that Hausdorff equal packing. And uh, actually there's been an improvement even better by, by, by Don's tool. And in this improvement, what he realizes is that this uh, uh, Marston theorem can be proven for any set for which the oracle that you have in the point to set principle is optimal enough, okay? Like you know, the, the best uh, oracle. So there is the best oracle for this set. And then you have Marston theorem. So I think this is very, very, nice uh, way of going back to trying to understand uh, this point to set principle in terms of computability. So I'll suggest that you look at uh, the last result. I, I don't know if the reference is at the end, but okay, it's very easy to find a style at 2021 in his web page. Okay, so there are many other uh, uh, results so far. They have to do with the intersection formula for a uh, fractal dimension. Uh, for instance, uh, Tedes Lehman proved that co analytic sets, uh, they don't have this capacitability uh, property. And I think Liu Yang mentioned an improvement on this, on the hypothesis that you need to have this result because there's some uh, logic uh, hypothesis. Uh, their results on female basis, you know, construction of female basis with any positive house of dimension. I'm, I'm sure I have left out interesting one. So this was kind of the first part of my presentation. I tried to convince you that 
there's not a single effectization, there are many, and somehow the point to set principle relates them. I, all the time, I was uh, staying in uh, the safe Cantor Euclidean state, uh, sorry, a space that, you know, it has very nice properties, including very nice uh, disjoint bases, you know, they very nicely uh, distinguish side. And that's very useful for, for instance, for gambling. Uh, but actually, if you have any uh, separable metric space that Sasha suggested some time ago, you can do Kolmogorov complexity. So, and Kolmogorov complexity is all you need for, for one of the sorts of effectivizations I was showing you. So, whenever you have a dense, uh, count uh, countable dense set in the space, you can define the Kolmogorov complexity of a point at a certain precision delta. That's all you need. You need a, a D that is a dense, countable, and of course you need an enumeration of D to do this Kolmogorov complexity, because well, what you're going to have is that uh, the Kolmogorov complexity of the point X at precision delta is going to be the shortest uh, description of a point in D in the delta ball of, uh, uh, of X. Okay, and so once you have that, it's immediate to, to get an effectivization. Of course, it's not, uh, so there's always, well, I, I'll, I'll probably tell them, I mean, there's the advantages of, you know, the both, both types of effectivization, gambling and uh, from the graph complexity, they have their, different advantages we may mention later. So anyway, once you have uh, a common complexity at precision delta, you can have halves of dimension, just take the ratio. And actually uh, you can even have uh, any gate uh, function in, in, this, in the place of the uh, usual uh, gauge function. And you can define uh, effective uh, uh, dimension uh, in a separable space X with a gauge uh, uh, function phi, P, P. Okay, so all you need to, to do is compare to, to the K with uh, phi of L, with phi of L. Okay? And somehow, as, as I tell you, this is easier than what Ted was trying to do Monday because I only need to know which is the S, okay, which is the breaking point. Okay, so I'm looking for, uh, for an S for which uh, phi S, uh, so the, uh, the Kolmogorov complexity is at most minor, the logarithm of one over phi, what I'm looking for. Okay. And for, uh, back dimension for a strong dimension, I can have a, a similar uh, definition. And well, uh, the effectivization is fine. I would even like it better if I could have at least two versions of this uh, effectivization. Somehow this seems to require this uh, phi gale, gale characterization seems to require some sort of very nice a uh, splitting of the space. It does happen in many interesting cases, but I'm not completely sure uh, how to get a clean characterization for, uh, for all separable spaces. That would be great. Probably gambling is not that easy. Mm. So the interesting thing is that we have been able to prove the point to set principle in all those cases for any separable space. Okay, so now, for any X that is separable, that's all I am requiring. And for any uh, uh, gauge function or gauge family, actually, uh, you can get back classical dimension, classical house of dimension, classical packing dimension. Yeah. So this uh, makes it, I think, even more interesting to know more about this oracle, okay? about these oracles in the point of sequence. So this, I, I am afraid like a few people in this audience have already listened to this talk before, but 
you know, you, you try to, you do some incremental progress, but you are not that fast. So I apologize. So let's say, for instance, let's try at least to play a game and look at an example of a separable space and try to see how you would uh, find out things about the space using this uh, effectivization. So for instance, uh, let's look at the Hilbert cube as this was a new example to us. And uh, let's try to see which is the right gauge function to deal with it and you know, what kind of, uh, of uh, geometric measure analysis we can do, okay? So let's just take a general Hilbert cube. X only needs to be compact, okay? Uh, then you, in order to, to do metric in the Hilbert cube, you kind of need a, Convergent series, well, an L2, L2 conversion sequence. So A, A n to a square needs to be conversion. And well, the Hilbert cube is just a sequence, uh, the set of infinite sequences okay, over the, the space X. And the metric is just, so uh, as you see there, take the met, uh, it's uh, the nth element, compare the nth elements of both sequences. And you take L2, that is your square, your, uh, how you say, you normalize just in the AN sequence. This is the distance. And well, it's very easy to see it has infinite house of dimension. It's kind of our uh, easy generalization of finite uh, uh, dimension cube. Okay. So, well, if you had to quickly figure out what is the right gate. Uh, function for, for this Hilbert cube, what would you do? Well, of course you can do it. Yeah, you just look at the definition, look at the covering and more or less figure out which is the right file you need to, to put there in order to make a, a hard sort of measure, you know, finite or at least jump from zero to infinity, so sorry, for infinity to zero at some point. Yeah, okay, I mean, you, you can do it. But using effectivization, for us, this is really easy. And I just wanted to show you how you can do it. Let me take a single example. You know, this idea of taking a Hilbert cube for, for general compact metric space is very useful, it's very interesting. But uh, you, you know that, uh, OK, yeah. I, I'll, I'll move quickly to the unit interval. That's not necessarily good. I mean, it depends on really on the kind of um, things you want to know with the Hilbert cube. You know, you know that in a sense, all separable spaces are within the Hilbert cube. But if you use generalized Hilbert cube instead of just yes, unit interval, this relation is closer. Okay. Anyway, what? How do you do the the gauge function? I I already kind of show you. Okay. Well. You need to know, you know, which is the right gauge function, knowing that you're going to try to, to bound to the minus k of uh, two minus uh, complexity at precision delta. Okay. So this is easy if you uh, figure out a, uh, a particular case, for instance, you take x to be the unit interval. And the, you, you have to fix the sequence. Let's fix one over n, the harmonic sequence. Okay, so if you do that, it's pretty easy to see how, how do you describe uh, at precision delta, you know, an infinite sequence, okay? And somehow you have to remember that you're using a dense set, a separator, so meaning for instance, you're using, uh, I don't know, rational or dyadic, whatever your favorite uh, uh, dense set is. And you're using finite sequences. So, okay, yes, the rest are zeros, for instance. If you do that, it's very easy to bound the Kolmogorov complexity of a point at a certain precision. You know, you just count like how many terms you need, you know, in order to, to have a small uh, tail of the, of the sequence. And the beginning, well, you get like very close representation of each of these real numbers in the sequence. So it's pretty easy to see that 
you can get, well, if precision is two to the minus k, you can represent the, the sequence with uh, length two to the kc. So this gives you very quickly that the kind of gauge family you need if you want to do dimension here, it's something like this, okay? So this is called the power exponential space. Okay, so it's putting an S within this, uh, this bound on the, on the yeah. Kolmogorov complex. So I think, I think this can be useful, like it. I mean, people, if you look at the papers on a, uh, Fractal geometry, people are really doing a case by case study of many spaces. So I think this gives us a sort of advantage. I think I would say that this sort of at least cutting the right uh, gauge function. Yes. Let me finish giving you uh, the promise uh, new results, but they are not that new anymore. Yeah, they're going to be presented next week at tax. They have to do with the hyperspace. Uh, so the hyperspace is the, if you have a, you start with the separable metric space and you look at the set of compact subsets of this X. And this compact, the, so the points in the new space are the compact subset. And the metric you use is the uh, house of metric, distance between two sets taken as the maximum between distance from one one set to the other and one set to the other. I think this is kind of standard. You may have seen it before. So you have this hyperspace. For instance, if you think about uh, uh, what is the separator, what kind of countable dense sets you have. Well, you just take a, a separator of X and maybe for instance, take a finite subsets of, of this separator. That would give you a pretty good, uh, representation or approximation of the hyperspace. Okay. So this, uh, uh, this hyperspace have been, has been studied. As I tell you, this is like a case by case. So this, uh, the papers only on this space. And for instance, McClure has published a couple in which he has tried to relate the dimension of uh, a set, a subset of of, of, of the underlying SpaceX, so the dimension of E and the dimension of the compact sets uh, within E. And they're very nice theorems, I'll show you one later. Uh, and he hasn't been able to do it like in a very general, well, in the most general case, it's never the first general, but he has deal with, for instance, self-similar sets and also sigma compact sets. So let me show you a theorem well, actually, of course, uh, as you can guess, the, the hyperspace has infinite dimension if you use the same uh, gate function as you do in the underlying space. So he was thinking only about uh, for, the, for X, just take the usual house of uh, dimension. And for the hyperspace, you need to take a different gauge function, of course, so that it's uh, non-infinite. Non and this is what he proved. So he was able to analyze, I mean, there are, there are a list of results, but I'm just singling out this one. So he was looking at a sigma compact set. And for those, he could prove that the packing dimension of the hyperspace of E with a certain uh, gauge function, I will read next, but you can recognize it as the uh, power exponential uh, gauge function or scale, I think they, they say scale. Uh, and this is at least the packing dimension of the underlying E. Okay? So this is, this is what he proved. Um, it is a very nice result, uh, but of course one can think of generalizing it a bit more. Why sigma compact cannot, cannot, cannot you do it a bit better? And also uh, the gauge function there, you know? Why, I mean, on the right, especially, you know. So if you start with a space with infinite dimension, but what's the deal? I mean, you may need a different gauge. Okay, so what we have done 
is we try to extend it to other sets and also to other gauge functions besides the canonical one. And for this, what we, see, I still have a few minutes, right? Yeah, let me just finish this, telling you a little bit how, how we deal with this one. So instead of taking uh, the usual canonical uh, delta to the S, it's like any other, and what we use is the YAV. This was already uh, known, uh, different applications. The YAV is kind of doing the same thing you do with the, with, with the canonical gauge function to get the power exponential, you do it for any other. So you, you jump, so uh, the, the uh, let's say p hat or whatever or tilde, tilde is uh, two to the minus one over here. And once you have that, what we were able to do is deal with analytic sets. So for analytic sets, we prove uh, basically McLuhan result, but for any gauge family. Okay? So on the right, you have any given T, and uh, for the hyperspace, you need to use uh, the jump of T. Um, let me just uh, finish giving you like, you know, the couple of places in which the point to set principle is, is important in this. Okay, I, won't, I will not give you the proof, but yes, I want you to realize how you prove something like that <laughs> using an effective dimension. Let's see if I can put this back. Yeah, I've been lucky. It has worked for me. I don't know what you do with it. It always works. <laughs> Sorry, never mind. <laughs> Be quiet for four years in case. Okay, so the idea is that, well, what you have is the point to set principle allows you to analyze points. And this is useful in any space. So for instance, here in the hyperspace, uh, you know that there is an oracle for which the dimension of the hyperspace is the dimension, the uh, effective dimension of the, of the hyperspace. And the effective dimension of the hyperspace it's always in terms of the points in the hyperspace. So there is a single Oracle A that I can use there. And I only need to deal with the dimension of, of these compact set, uh, sets uh, with Oracle A. Okay, so now these compact sets are the points in the hyperspace okay? that I am approximating using my dense set of, my dense, uh, set of uh, finite subsets of, of the dense set of correct. So what you need to do is you need to construct a single compact set that has high Kolmogorov complexity. Okay, so in order to, so you need to, to do a lower bound on this dimension of the hyperspace. So you need to know that the Kolmogorov complexity is at least something. And so in terms of uh, packing dimension, you need to, to do something like that. Show that the dimension of, a, of L is at least S with the adequate uh, oracle and gauge function. And the advantage is that this is packing dimension. And in packing dimension, you don't need to, so you, what you need to do is show that the Kolmogorov complexity is infinitely often as large. This is something that looks doable. Of course, you need to know exactly what's your goal. Let's see, you need to, to construct a set L that has, you know, at least this Kolmogorov complexity. And the second ingredient, I mean, this is not completely trivial, the construction is interesting, but you, you kind of see uh, the idea of why, why we, we were able to do it for packing dimension. Also, uh, as I tell you, we were able to prove the theorem for analytic uh, set. What's the deal with analytic set? Well, you have a dimension capacity, which means that the dimension of the set is represented by the dimension of its compact subset. So we, in fact, we only need to deal with the compact uh, set K. So for compact sets, things are much easily, uh, easier. So you have a compact set E and the packing dimension of this set is, is easier to grasp. I mean, it's, 
not the same, but it's close enough to what is called as a box count in dimension. So things become combinatorial in that sense. So you have some sort of a nice combinatorial bound. You have to do a Kolmogorov complexity incompressibility argument you know, by you know, getting out of this combinatorial, uh, of this covering, of this box counting covering. So it's an interesting proof. But the, yeah, the main ingredient is the point to set principle that allows you to to go from a, from a full hyperspace to building a single compact. I don't think I'll say much more. <coughs> so let me just uh, finish well with some open questions and kind of first uh, kind of summarizing. So what I wanted to tell you today is that uh, the point, I mean, I mean like the final line of you know, many talks on this point to set principles is that uh, we should prove many uh, classical dimension results using a point to set principle. But there's another punchline is we need to understand what's going on in this point to set principles because it will give us back many information or many insight about the effective dimension. So I wrote a few like more concrete questions related mostly to the hyperspace uh, results. So, for instance, I mean, it's very nice to be able to do this for analytic, for compact. Can you do it somewhere else? I mean, it has to be, I don't know, it's, it's back in dimension, okay? It's, you only need uh, to, to have a, an, an infinitely often, sorry, uh, yeah, that's it, yeah, an infinitely often lower bound. It could be, it could be something better that we can do than more than analytic. Uh, of course, the big question is the second. Do it with household dimension, okay? Deal with the infinitely often case. And well, and the, the last question is kind of trying to, this, this idea that I wanna know more about the oracles in the point to set principle. Okay, if we cannot do it in general, of course, you know, the one the strategy is to sort of, um, classify, you know, like single out classes of uh, sets for which these oracles are nice, or I don't know, or uh, uh, how you say, uh, relate the oracle on the set, et cetera. But another thing is uh, the approach of uh, Don Stuhl. He wanted to, to know mo more about Marston theorem of projection. He looks at the oracles for this particular theorem. So let's maybe look at the oracles for the hyperspace uh, dimension and see you know if if we can learn more about the problem by by studying the oracle symbol okay. well i think this is it thank you very much i'll show you my references uh, nice talk questions sasha do i have a kind of uh, this way, patience. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a quite uh, strange philosophical question. So it's uh, the naive viewpoint is that for a point, we have a function which says uh, how large uh, this Kolmogorov complexity of approximation to precision epsilon. And then what you're trying to do, you will compare this function with, with, with some reference families. You can take reference family, this reference family, that, but why do you in general want to compare it with reference families? It's somehow useful, but there is just one object, this function, which somehow is, is how the complexity grows. And there are some, something that, that, that all these dimension things are kind of secondary, depending of which kind of measure tape you use to measure this thing. Why, why not? To, why you are so obsessed with, with gauge function? That's, that's the well, obsessed, I mean, it's, I mean uh, let's see. Okay, let's try to give a, a good answer, not because I like them, because <laughs> that doesn't. <laughs> okay, well, I guess as a, only as a quantitative tool, you know, you, you're dealing with a sort of program problem. If you can get a gauge uh, family, you'll be able to have like, uh, you know, this is dimension zero, this is dimension positive. Uh, it will give you an advantage, you know, like, so for instance, uh, 
uh, since this is dimension bigger than zero, I'm able to build things in this side. I, I don't know. Yeah, this is, I guess, quantitative analysis can always be useful. So uh, if you find the gauge function, the right gauge uh, function, you can do the analysis. Otherwise, uh, you just get zero or infinity. That's not that important. I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer. But <laughs> I think, isn't it just really to separate sets, right? I mean, to, to, to make, to, you know, you could distinguish different sets, right? So, you know, a lot, there are lots of sets with dimension zero, right? But if you could distinguish among them, right, you're learning something. No, of course not. Yeah, yeah, you, you, why this, yeah, I know. It's like, yeah, you, yeah. Yeah, I was playing, I, I don't know, were you in uh, Ted Slayman's talk the other day? I was also thinking about, you know, like the choice of age versus, I mean, what, what comes first, the, the set or, or the age? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never mind. yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting idea. But I question, what, what, I mean, what to do first? To choose the, the gauge function or, I mean, or why is it interesting? So maybe more examples would be nice to see. <laughs> Other other questions? Online? Uh, that's that probably was there before. But I can try. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again. Nice talk.